everyone. In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, the different states of metabolism. So the two states of metabolism that we mentioned previously are the absorptive state and the post-absorptive state. And so we'll start with the absorptive state and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what happens to all the different organic nutrients during this time, we'll talk about the hormones that, that have some control over the events, and then we'll move on and do the same um, sort of mirror the process for the post-absorptive post state. All right, so we'll start with the absorptive state, and the absorptive state is alternatively called the fed state, um, and this makes sense because it's actually the time during and shortly after eating when nutrients enter the blood from the GI tract. So we know that as soon as food enters the, the, the GI tract, um, and, and technically, I mean, we start secreting enzymes, you know, before there's even um, contact with food, but, but as soon as there's food, you know, in the stomach and in the small intestine, you know, many, many hormones and enzymes are being secreted in order to ensure that, that everything is being broken down. And so just as a reminder, um, uh, and we'll sort of uh, work our way through the different, um, the different organic molecules, but we can start with carbohydrates. Just as a reminder, the, um, the carbohydrates have to be broken down to monosaccharide level in order to be absorbed into the intestinal mucosa um, and then be transferred ultimately to capillaries. And so, um, so um, another, this is uh, way back, um, but uh, the monosaccharides that are available are obviously glucose, but also fructose and galactose are considered monosaccharides. So um, glucose, fructose, and galactose can all be absorbed uh, through the intestinal mucosa. And then um, also remember that they're going to be transported from the, um, as soon as they enter the capillaries, uh, you know, from the intestinal mucosa, they're gonna travel via the hepatic portal system directly to the liver for processing. So, um, so th those actions are, are inevitable. And um, what we're gonna mention here is basically what happens next. So um, in the liver, galactose and fructose will be converted to glucose. And um, once they're converted to glucose, the, the glucose can then be released in, back into the bloodstream for circulation throughout the body. Um, or if there's uh, plenty of glucose and there isn't any need, then it can be converted to glycogen and stored for later. The additional glucose, so we know that, um, that, that uh, as far as what's coming from the small intestine, um, from the intestinal tract, usually, generally the small intestine though is, what, is where this is gonna happen. Um, the, there's uh, all the, glu the, the glucose is, um, is going to be picked up by the liver as well, right? It's following the same pathway. Um, but the liver, so the liver may decide to keep that glucose and then, you know, again, convert to glycogen or, or use it to make energy. Um, or that glucose may just sort of pass through the liver and travel elsewhere in the body. So a couple of different options for the glucose, but the things that are non-glucose have to be converted to glucose right away. All right, next we're going to talk about um, triglycerides. And so the triglycerides, remember, um, initially they're not going to be triglycerides. So um, if we sort of uh, trace the pathway from, from what happens uh, initially, so when um, lipids appear in the GI tract and particularly in the, in the small intestine, bile is going to be released and it's um, going to emulsify the lipid droplets and, and make them into very tiny lipid droplets. And then ultimately they'll be, um, they'll be surrounded and they get reformed into these things called chylomicrons, which um, which are necessary in order to um, be absorbed into the um, absorbed through the the structures of the small intestine into the lymphatic vessels. So we know they get absorbed into lacteals, and then ultimately we still want to be able to access those lipids. Um, and so when they uh, get back dumped back into regular circulation, um, they have to pass through capillaries, and so the capillaries are gonna um, secrete this um, enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. And so basically it breaks down chylomicrons to release fatty acids and glycerol. And so once we have the fatty acids and glycerol, they can, um, th they can travel easily in the capillaries and um, they, can, they can become a, a, a primary source of energy. Um, so particularly skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, liver um, and adipose cells are gonna be utilizing fatty acids and glycerol as a, as a primary source of energy. And lastly, amino acids. Amino acids also enter the capillaries um, through the intestinal mucosa, and they travel to the liver via the hepatic portal system. So uh, once we get to the liver, there's a couple of options. Um, some of the amino acids are taken up by the liver and converted to keto acids for the Krebs cycle um, for, or, or for storage as fat in the liver. Some amino acids are utilized by the liver to synthesize plasma proteins such as albumin, clotting proteins, and transport proteins. But most of the amino acids actually remain in the sinusoids, which are the liver capillaries. Those just sort of pass through the liver and then ultimately be taken up by other body cells. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about the hormonal control of the absorptive state. Um, so primarily the hormone that factors in here is insulin. So insulin has uh, a multitude of functions. Um, it facilitates glucose entry into adipose cells, which we mentioned. Insulin um, stimulates fatty acid synthesis when uh, liver glycogen is high. Insulin inhibits the breakdown of fat in um, adipose tissue. All right, so this makes sense too because if there was too much um, too much glucose already, then we don't need to break down the fat and then ultimately have more energy. We have uh, we have plenty. Another thing that can happen here is the glucose can be utilized to make glycerol, um, and then ultimately combine with fatty acids to make triglycerides. So it doesn't just have to be transported in for utilization during um, glycolysis in the Krebs cycle. It could be utilized for other reasons too. Um, it causes the uptake of amino acids. And it increases the permeability of many uh, of many cells to potassium, magnesium, and, and phosphate ions. And um, this this combined with the fact that it activates sodium potassium pump um, can uh, can cause entry of, of potassium into cells. Um, so it's really um, important to note, and this is something that uh, may be familiar because we think about treatment of hyperkalemia. So in cases where um, a patient has hyperkalemia, um, there's an excess of potassium in the blood which we normally know that the excess of potassium should be inside of the cells, not outside. Insulin administration is part of the cascade of, uh, of, of medications that are given for patients who are hyperkalemic, and so um, it's actually going to acutely suppress plasma potassium. And that, um, that makes sense because um, we know that it can increase the permeability of the cell and, uh, pota and potassium can enter into the cells. All right, so now let's move on and talk about the post-absorptive state. So the post-absorptive state is basically the fasting state. So it's the period when the GI tract is empty. So it's been, you know, I don't know, maybe four hours, five hours, six hours since the last meal. Um, so body reserves are actually broken down to supply energy. So we know that normal blood sugar is between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. And um, we think about that in terms of something that we want to kind of maintain um, no matter what the circumstances are. Otherwise, we want to keep it right around there. So if there's a high level of nutrients being um, absorbed into the bloodstream from food that's just been consumed, then we want to kind of suppress it. If on the other hand, there's, uh, there's a, a deficiency because it's been a while since the last meal, we can just um, break down what we already have to work with. So the things that we'll do, um, one, we'll perform glycogenolysis. So that means breakdown of glycogen from the liver. Number two, glycogenolysis from skeletal muscle. So it's actually easier and more accessible to, um, to get the glycogen from the liver than it is the skeletal muscle. But once we use up the, the liver glycogen, um, or you know we're using it, we're also gonna start using the glycogen from the skeletal muscle. And so um, it's actually um, interesting because it's, uh, the glycogen is going to be released as pruvic acid, travel to the liver, and then be converted to glucose. Three, lipolysis. Um, so this will generally occur in the adipose um, tissue in the liver. Um, and we're actually gonna, um, we're gonna make glycerol from uh, the breakdown. So think triglycerides are gonna break down into fatty acids and glycerol. And so then we'll have uh, a release of glycerol. Um, it'll travel to the liver and then um, it'll be utilized for gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis, remember, is synthesis of new glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. So something that is not glucose or fructose or um, anything similar to that in terms of it um, being carbohydrate um, can, can uh, be utilized for gluconeogenesis and, and made into glucose. And then number four, we can have breakdown of cell proteins. So um, amino acids will be deaminated and converted to glucose in the liver. Now these specific functions, I just want to mention um, glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and um, you know amino acid deamination, those things. We're going to um, discuss those uh, in a separate video when we talk about the specific metabolism of the different organic molecules. So, um, so if you're looking for more information about those, just know that it's coming in a different video. Now let's just also mention quickly the um, hormonal control of the post-absorptive state. So there are multiple hormones that will participate, but glucagon is kind of the primary hormone that we're um, going to discuss here. So in response to a decrease in blood glucose level, there's a couple things that are going to happen. One, we're going to get um, suppression of insulin release, which means that we're going to inhibit insulin-induced uh, cell activities. And then two, the alpha pancreatic cells, which we know produce glucagon, will secrete the glucagon into the bloodstream and allow it to travel 
to its target tissue, so namely the liver, where um, the hepatocytes will perform gluco, uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, and then also to the adipose tissue where the adipose cells will perform lipolysis and then um, produce, as a result, fatty acids and glycerol, which ultimately can, uh, can be released into the bloodstream. Some other hormones that uh, participate along with glucagon are epinephrine, growth hormone, thyroxine, cortisol, and testosterone. So there really are quite a few hormones that, that all sort of play a role here. But, um, but like I said, the one I want to focus on is, is glucagon just because um, it's, it sort of opposes insulin and, um, and it's definitely um, important to, to mention to, to properly prepare us, uh, us for the uh, discussion on the different types of organic molecule metabolism. All right, so that concludes our discussion on the absorptive and post-absorptive states. And uh, coming up will be um, independent discussions on the different types of um, organic molecule metabolism. So thanks for watching.